Okay, everybody, welcome, welcome to day four of Macro Week, of B&H's Macro Week, uh, where we like to make big things out of little items. Um, we are going to have a great day today, wrap up our four-day series with our guest Jillian Bell, who will take us through her uh, techniques and tactics for to photograph rings and things. And at 2 p.m., we will have uh, another special guest, Don Kamarechka, who will show us um, the amazing universe at our feet as he goes over his, his, his unique eye and incredible capability of photographing things that um, we tend to take for granted or just wouldn't see without true use of macro. Again, my, ho my name is Christian Domek, and I'm with b &H Photo and Video. And here's our guest speakers today. In just a second here, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera on and we'll get started right away with Jillian Bell. Okay. Hey, Jillian, how you doing? I'm doing good today. Yeah. Glad to be here. I'm glad you're here as well. As soon as I get my camera on, I'll be even more glad. There I am. Yay. <laughs> Yay, technology. I've only done this four days in a row. You think I'd get this down pat, right? <laughs> It always throws something different at you. I I've love been it. doing Zoom now for a year, and there's always like something different that's never happened before. So you just be prepared. That's it. It's all about mm -hmm. the it's all about the uh, randomness of the uh, digital age in which we live in. <clears throat> and so, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you will, and then we'll give you the full range to to show us your stuff. Sure. So many of you have seen my presentations before. Welcome back. If anyone is new to me, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Jillian. I'm a national technical representative for Tamron USA. We make lenses for a whole smattering of different camera brands and um, different camera mounts. So I like to focus on the lenses, the focal lengths, the angle of views, and the techniques. So um, my genres of choice are macro. Macro is something that I always look for no matter where I'm at. Um, I focus on building scenes, using what I have around me instead of getting big, expensive studio sets. I, I tend to do a little more DIY. I know Christian and I were talking about this a little bit. Yep. You kind of build the story in your mind, figure out how you can create that story and what you need to um, relay it photographically. I think the DIY aspect is is super important, especially for people who are well, not just for people who are starting out, to be honest, because, mm -hmm. you know, you may need something to hold that thing up and uh, I don't have a professional clamp or I don't have a weird arm or something, you know, that I could order online. Maybe I just need to uh, get creative with what I do have, a couple of paper clips and uh, <laughs> some rubber bands or something. You never know, right? I mean, use what you have. I will say there is definitely an advantage to buying all the right equipment. <laughs> that is um, true. You're joining me in my home studio today, so there is nobody that I have to impress here. But back when I used to do this for freelance and for my profession, if, if I didn't show up with like the light tables and the clamps and all the different things, there wasn't as much respect, I don't think. Uh, yeah, yeah, fair enough. So you got to look well, the part. Yeah, <laughs> you got to look the part sometime, right? <laughs> uh, I never looked the part at all. Well, let's let's uh, go ahead and dive right in. We'd love to see what you what you want to teach us. Sure. Go ahead and share my screen here. And this is going to be a really quick thirty minutes. Feel free to find either the Q and A or the chat, and um, let's have an open conversation about what we're doing. Yeah, that's a good point. By the way, we also have people uh, moderating our YouTube channel. And this will be recorded on our YouTube channel for everyone who may have come in a little bit late or want to review um, today and the previous days. Uh, so um, don't feel pressured if you have to you know, go somewhere, but uh, we love having you here and, and ask the questions. We, we'll get them over to Jillian as soon as we can. Mm -hmm. Now, the main two things I wanna show you today is I'm going to start with an environmental macro, so more of a wide angle something we can use with more diffused light in an everyday situation. And then I'm gonna show you more of a traditional catalog macro, something with a longer depth of field, something with a lot more detail. Um, at first, I just wanna lift up the brand, show you the website. So you, when, when you go home, when you're doing your own research, when you're going through all the different product options at b &H, use the website, use the resources that you have so you can be educated and have a good idea of what you're looking for. 
tamron-usa.com is the Tamron US landing page for all of you. And it's, it's had a revamp over the last year or so. So I wanted to make sure you knew how to get there and see all of the great new features that are built into this site. This is just the landing page. You can find a local dealer. I know b &H is worldwide, one of the largest camera stores that we have working with us today. Product section. And then in the featured comments, you can find things like seasonal rebates, events that are going on. Uh, this homeschool link has so many hands-on videos and interviews with our pros and binge-worthy phototainment. So definitely check that out if you're, if you're running out of things to watch. Did you just say phototainment? I sure did. That's awesome. I'm using it. <laughs> I stole it from somebody else, but it, that's exactly what we do. It's, it's educational, photographic entertainment because you have to have fun, really. I love it. Uh, there are some special Mother's Day savings that are going on right now. These are instant, so you don't have to mail in a rebate to do the, any of these. Highlighting the, the Sony line. But these are in, in uh, combination with some of the other national rebates that we have going on right now. So you can see you get anywhere from $50 to $100 off on whole splattering of lenses. They go through the fourth. The Mother's Day rebates go through the ninth. So definitely check those out. Again, tamron-usa.com. You can also find them on Instagram and Facebook. This, this is a this is kind of like a photographic family for me. Um, we're really responsive to questions and just problem solving. The camera that I use really just depends on the day. I have a Canon, I have a Sony, I have an Olympus, I have my cell phone, you know, use what you have. For me, it's about the lenses, the focal lengths I choose help change the story and change the purpose of the photos. All right. So the first thing I wanna show you, now I've got a couple of different setups here. And again, this is very DIY, just kind of setting this up on my desk to show you that it is possible to get professional quality images um, in a home setup. The first one was this one here. This is my environmental scene. And what I have is a 20 millimeter Sony lens on my mirrorless camera. It doesn't matter that it's a mirrorless on a lens on a mirrorless body. It's just a wide angle lens with an incredible minimum focusing distance. Uh, this 20 millimeter here has a minimum focusing distance of 4.7 inches, so just under five inches, gives us a one to two macro capability. So I'm able to get close up photographs in a more environmental scene. Lighting, I've got one light here, it's an LED light. And the trick here for environmental lighting and um, environmental wide angle macro is you want really diffused soft light. This is just an LED and I put a white t-shirt over it to make it softer. Very again, DIY. It's but I like having DIY. a DIY. Mm -hmm. I like it because I can still get at the controls through the head holes and through the, the, the side arms here. I can still control the light and it just, it's simple, it works. Setting wise, we're thinking about this in a couple of different ways. I know this is environmental. I want the bouquets, I want the flowers to be there in essence, but not in detail. So I'm gonna keep my aperture really nice and low at 2.8. I'm gonna keep my ISO low as well, ISO 100. That's just gonna kind of help keep um, very low digital noise, very nice clarity. The lighting here I placed slightly behind my subject. So it's coming back from this area here. And we do that especially with flowers and with fruit, anything that has some good texture to it, it's best to put your light slightly behind your subject so that we can really highlight the texture of those petals. The other thing I'm gonna bring in is a reflector. So this is just a really small macro reflector. These things are great. They, they um, get really small. Uh, the claps it's about right the down. size of a softball. Yeah, so nice. I keep them in my glove box. I keep them in my camera bag. I've got a million of them. Silver on one side, white on the other. 
So on my screen, let me show you what this is doing. This is taking this light. You can kind of see it's bringing that back oh, yeah. in, bringing that detail back into the front. It's a little bit darker than I would like. So I've got two options. I can either, because I'm all locked down and I'm on a tripod, I can make my slower, my shutter speed slower to make this brighter. Gotcha. And, and which okay. 20 millimeter was that? The Sony, which one? Uh, this is the 20 millimeter Tamron DI3 2.8. Gotcha. So it's a Sony native lens that we make, or it's a Tamron native lens for Sony full frame. Very nice and small. There we go. Manual focus just zooms in at man or automatically so you can kind of see the detail. Mm -hmm. And you can see wherever I move this reflector kind of changes the shiny spots on the jewelry. So I kind of want to light up the front of that ring. Two second timer. And there we go. Really nice, soft. Um, the background's going to change depending on the, the other colors of the flowers that you have. I chose red and yellow just because it helps the white stand out a little bit more. And if I want to see more of that, I could just undiffuse my light, make the light brighter. See, now you can see a little bit more detail. This is where barn doors would come in really helpful because you can direct the light. You can put a little bit more light on your background and a little less light on your subject. Mm -hmm. But taking the diffusion off, you can see very quickly how that changes the contrast. Now I can do a faster shutter speed because I've got more light. Two second timer. A little bit different. Yeah. But about the same. That's the first one. That's the second one. I think the, the brighter contrast is really nice. Yeah. Kind of makes the, the jewelry crisper. Um, but I am definitely losing a little bit of light on the on the on the groom's ring. So what we can do is bring that reflector back in and just capture that light and shape it, mold it, put it where we want it to go. Right out. That's a little bit better. Yep, open it up a little bit, huh? Mm -hmm. I really don't make, mean to make this sound so easy. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. So I'm going to go try some of these techniques you're showing me, and uh, it's not going to look like that, and I'm going to be bummed. So what do I have to do? Practice? Don't tell me practice. That's what everyone says. Photograph more. There you huh? go. Yeah. <laughs> That's a real trick, huh? Lot, <laughs> lots of practice, lots of problem solving. The nice thing is if you kind of break down how you build your scene and think about these things, it gets really easy. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a nice question from Barb. I see, have I tethered my iPad to my camera? Oh, yeah. Um, I actually haven't. Actually, let me think about this. My iPad is actually tethered to my laptop so that I can show it to you, share it via uh, the cable. But I'm using the Sony Wi-Fi remote on my iPad. So the app that Sony comes out with, that's how I'm controlling my camera with my iPad. Have Canon has one. Nikon has one. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to ask, have you tried uh, photographing directly into Lightroom, triggering it from Lightroom? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It works really well, actually. You can tether, if you have the newest version of Lightroom, classic or the, the more, the mobile friendly one actually works really well for tethering cameras wirelessly. Uh, you can download the Lightroom mobile app on Android or Apple and control your camera, control the import and everything from your device. It's, it's so seamless. Um, Good point. You definitely get better connectivity and faster performance with the, the, the actual cable. Like if you can uh, hardwire things in, it's mm -hmm. much more consistent. But Wi-Fi works in a pinch if you need it. Right. 
Okay. Any other questions so far? Nope, Last we had this. a question about your lens and your tether so far. Okay. Well, good, let me switch over to the other one. I like environmental macro. Uh, this is, it's also called wide angle macro. This is uh, a newer, it's an old idea that's, that's become popular recently. Many of the Tamron lenses strive in this close focus capability because our minimum object distance or you know, as close as your, your um, subject can get to the front of the lens is second to none in the Tamron brand. Uh, if you have the 28 to 75, the 17 to 28, um, 24 to 70, any of these lenses have macro capabilities. You just got to figure out how close can you get the subject to the front mm -hmm. of your lens. I'm, and when you are approaching your subject, we just got a question. Um, when you're approaching your subject or you're, you're, you're thinking about your, your next shoot for macro, um, mm -hmm. what determines which lens that you want to select? I mean, I would think of that that's probably going to be dependent on what you are photographing, but you, what take us through your process of selecting which lens you'd like to utilize for whatever shoot. That's a great question. It depends on if I want it to be commercial or environmental. So when I say commercial, that's gonna be the next scene that I show you. Uh, it's much more about the product. It's much more about a specific thing. I'm gonna choose more of a telephoto lens for a couple of different reasons. One, I'm gonna get better working distance. So you can see here, like I'm literally right on top of my subject. And that can be hard when we're lighting things. That can be hard when we want to fix our product because uh, you just can't without getting your hands in your camera. Um, telephoto lenses also have more of a compressive quality to it. So these wide angles are great for environmental. And what I mean by that is I mean, you can get bits of what's around the thing you're trying to photograph with the subject matter. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. And we had a comment- You never really uh, know how to put it into words. Yeah, no, that, I think that worked out well. Uh, someone mentioned they see the Tamron 90 millimeter repeatedly mentioned for macro photography. And is it one that you use? That is the one I'm putting on right now, actually. There you go. Right By the way, here. for the longest time, if I'm not mistaken, Tamron was kind of holding the record for what seemed to be the sharpest macro lens on the market for a good long time. So you guys have yeah. always been really, really strong in the macro scene with your 90 millimeter. The 90 millimeter macro, you are 100% right, correct. It's been an industry leader for years. Uh, this is the newest version of it, which has better weather sealing. It has image stabilization built in. It's got better front element coatings. It's got all the new technology. And that's important because you can now get your camera into harder to shoot situations, high contrast shooting directly into light. You can go out in the rain and it's fine. Uh, it's just more durable for those weird situations. Right. So when you're um, spritzing the flower and it accidentally gets on the barrel of your lens, you don't have to stress as much as you used to. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, nope. Uh, for this one, I'm, I'm grabbing a smaller light. This is just another little LED light. You can use strobes. You can use flash. Um, you'll get faster shutter speeds and crisper edges with a strobe or a flash. Mm -hmm. But I like LEDs because you can change the color temperature, warm yep. versus cool. Uh, it's, it's a workable light, so I can see exactly what it's doing and where, where I need to place it. Mm -hmm. It's also cool. So especially if you're working with insects or flowers, it's not going to get really hot. So your flowers won't wilt. Um, if you're one of those people that sticks bugs in fridges to cool them down, they won't warm back up again. I know people who do this. <laughs> yeah, or bugs. Ah, they're fine. Mm -hmm. um, so you see here, I've already gained my working distance. This is again with the 90 millimeter macro. Minimum focusing distance is 11 inches from the sensor plane. So we're measuring from way back here in the, in the camera sensor. Mm -hmm. I've also done this type of photography with uh, 70 to 200 2.8. You put a, an extension tube set on it 
And now we get macro capability, like one-to-one -one macro capability on a 200 millimeter lens, which gives us a lot more working distance to, to play with our subject matter to kind of build the scene. Yeah, you and I talked about that, I guess, one of our first uh, uh, sessions together, and it, it kind of blew me away. I, I, you see these long zooms, 7200, another one to say zoom on there, and they say macro at the end of it. And I never mm -hmm. really put it together. Maybe I've done it on accident just to get a, a little bit closer to the flower, but you routinely handhold these telephoto lenses and use oh, it yeah. as a macro lens. And I think that's amazing. I am, I'm a handhold photographer. I, I have, this is how I was taught. Yeah. And then I got really lazy with uh, image stabilization. You can handhold down to a 15th of a second Ooh. and it just allows you to play with composition a little bit more. And the big thing, where was my thought train going? Nope, oh, sorry, derailed mm -hmm. you. <laughs> nope, you're fine. <laughs> we're talking about working distance. We're talking about image stabilization. If you're on a tripod, we'll start with this. I'll shut your stabilization off. Yeah. It, it does a really funny thing where it will actually create more motion to correct itself and your photos will never be sharp. Oh, I remember. You were talking about how there are many zoom lenses that say macro, yes? Right, right. And this means your lens can give you at least a one to four macro capability. You're looking at an object about the size of a three and a half by five photograph. It's a one quarter life-size representation or better. So if you have a zoom lens that says macro, you know that you can photograph something that's about this big. Okay. That's good to know. What, what I'm doing here, let me crank up this light to 100%. This scene is a lot darker. And you notice again that I'm not using fancy backdrops. I'm not using a light tent. You can. Mm -hmm. This is literally a mirror set inside a coffee cup because that's what I have. <laughs> and it works out to be about the same height. Right. Um, for this one specifically, it's all about the depth of field. So now this is gonna be more of a catalog shoot. So I want a lot of detail from front to back. Okay. I'm gonna set an F11. You're gonna see the image get a lot darker. This is gonna be a lot slower shutter speed. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to control my ambient light with my ISO. So I'm actually going to crank this all the way up to 800. I don't worry about digital noise because newer cameras today, you can, but you can do like what, 3 million ISO on some of these things. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? The magic elastic <laughs> ISO, who knew that was going to be a thing? It's oh, it's insane. Speaking of getting more so, things in, in, focus there. Do you ever work with the focus stacking? I was going to uh, mention that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I beat you to it. Sorry. It always comes up in these conversations. Yep. Focus stacking. Yes, I, I, I do. I have done focus stacking in the past. Um, however, I don't like to do it just because it takes time away from actually building a scene and um, being in the photographic environment. Um, if I do, I might only stack like two or three images. Uh, personally, my style is to get it better with depth of field than with, um, than with focus stacking. Gotcha. Pixel diffraction isn't much of an issue anymore. So that's when, again, the image isn't quite as sharp because the pixels are actually vibrating as this, this long depth of field is being captured. Hmm. It will, um, I, I do focus stack if shutter speed is an issue. So like if I'm not in a controlled environment like this mm -hmm. and I'm out in um, outside and it's a little bit windy, I can't clamp down all of my, all of my things and it's moving. Um, I'll do a focus stack so that I can get a much faster shutter speed and then get the crisp focus from front to back. All right. There's a lot of different techniques about it. Yeah. Um, just depends on what you like. I'll do um, helicon focus. I've used Photoshop. Yeah. I've used helicon as well. Yep, that's really popular. It's not too like over the top technical. 
-hmm. All right, let's see what this is doing. All right. And just let you know, we're about six minutes out. So yep. that went by fast. You weren't it kidding. It did. All right. All right. So that's not a terrible first image. Right. It's not you great. Can, you can work with that and you know where to go from there. Mm -hmm. You can see the green reflecting on the uh, one. I have to clean my mirror, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, this green color here, I don't like, and that is from my flowers. So if oh. I take this away, it goes away. Isn't and someone made a comment to what is the main way you're able to get that vintage look in the image now? Is that a quality of the Tamron lenses or lighting? What do you mean by vintage? I'm not entirely sure, but it does have, I think it's the warmth of the light you're using, to be honest. Mm. And, and the fact that it's a, it has a lot of fall off in the background, but, but I could be wrong. And if I, if I missed that, Derek, please uh, um, let, let us know. We can get that question answered for you. I am a vintage kind of person, so maybe that just bleeds over. <laughs> if I can find anything that's still functional in, a, in an antique store or in a, in a uh, oh, that's much, much better. See, the yep. green one away. Yep, the green one away. You're opening up some of those shadows in the background there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other reason why I, don't, I do not do a complete and total sharpness from front to back is because you lose the dimension of the item. There's still a 3D aspect of this mm -hmm. that I think is attractive. Yeah. The last little thing that I want to do. So like if I really want to change, like get a white background, I just put my reflector or put a white piece of paper on top. Okay. That changes the scene. It's a mirror. So it'll yep. reflect anything that you have. The fast way to uh, cover up any dust you happen to see on your scene too. <laughs> yep. Uh, my light here is, is in the front. Let me switch back over to my camera. The light here is facing the front here at a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. And then I place my reflector opposite that at a 45 degree angle as well. So it's, it's getting even light from side to side. That's important. Mm -hmm. Let's do one more. The closer to the front that I put my reflector, the more reflection I'm going to get in that ring. So I'm gonna actually move the light a little bit more towards forward. So that really lit up the gym, the gym. Mm -hmm. This is actually my class ring from uh, high school. Figure out exactly how old I am. <laughs> there, now we're getting into something. Yep. I don't use circular polarizing filters for this. Specifically because it doesn't do anything. I do have one on my camera now, and you can see that as I spin it, the placing of the reflection does change, mm. but it's not getting rid of any of the reflections because my lights are not at a 90 degree angle. True. So if you do not have one, don't fret about it too much. If you do have one, you can actually kind of change where those reflections are. So I'm going to primarily focus on the mirror on the bottom. Okay. Only a couple minutes left. That's it. Any closing thoughts? Any, uh, anything no, else? No questions. We did uh, get a couple of compliments. People really enjoy your setup and uh, it really, I think we could have gone on for a lot longer than 30 minutes. That kind of flew by. I'm not going to, not going to lie. Next time, totally next time. Did. yep. Next time we'll have to do a full hour, maybe, huh? No, yeah. half hour stuff. All my speakers need an hour at least. So, wow. Well, oh man, thank you, Jillian. Um, that was fun. I, I really prefer to stay on for another half hour or so, learn more <laughs> with you. That, that was great. Uh, but we do have a, another great guest coming up here. Um, Thank you again. Always appreciate working with you. Hopefully I uh, get to see you in real life, as they say, coming up here, possibly in WPPI. Yeah. Yeah. As of right now, our, our team is, is booking reservations and getting ready to go out in August to Las Vegas, but we're always prepared for something to change, but I'm there you go. We'll yeah. Roll there. with the punches. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Jillian. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Don Komarechka. Uh, coming to us live from Canada. How are you doing up north? I'm doing well. How about you, Christian? I'm well as well. I uh, really appreciate you coming and sharing your uh, your art with us today. 
Um, if you want, go, if, for, for the few people that may not know who you are, would you do a little background on yourself and then sure. I'll give you full control of the cameras. I'm, uh, I'm sort of a, I've been called like a mad scientist macro photographer, and I don't mind that name at all because uh, there's a lot of science in photography and there's a lot of art in photography as well. And mixing those two things together, uh, I think is really important. It, in fact, that, that's a, almost like a magical mesh fabric that you can make. And uh, if you have one or the other, you can still do good work. There, there's no question about it. But when you have them both running in tandem together um, and you find ways for art to weave into science and the other way around, then that's where the, I think the true spirit of photography comes in. Now, the thing is, macro photography is very uh, technical. Uh, you know, in, in controlling your depth of field and controlling your subject and, and all these uh, different elements. And so it really embodies that, that mentality. And there is just so much to explore. Part of the uniqueness, I think, is, is the fact that, you know, if you're a landscape photographer, you can make a great image. But if it's a great landscape, chances are somebody's been there before you, yeah. right? Ch chances are that that image that you just made has been made or something very similar has been made by many other photographers, um, or there will be many behind you if you are a pioneer in that area. But macro photography uh, tends to be much more unique. And that I, I I personally feel that makes it more valuable, uh, especially when you are trying to be both the photographer and the artist at the same time. So that uh, that's kind of a nutshell of, of what kind of drives me photographically. Yeah. I do want to do a, a screen share here and, and you'll Please see do. sort of what the um, the idea is behind this, uh, this craziness. Um, and in some cases, you know, I, I call it the universe at our feet because just as I previously mentioned, there is so much to explore even in your own backyard. It's just, it, it's endless what the possibilities are. Um, and I mean, okay, I, I'm in Canada. Not everybody is in a, a, a climate that gets snow in the wintertime. And I'm not going to uh, lean on this one too heavily. I do want to mention that I'm known uh, quite well for my work photographing snowflakes. I'm not going to talk about that much uh, in this presentation, but there is literally two feet from my back door, uh, never ending, uh, beautiful complexities of nature that can be documented with a camera and it, it becomes beautiful. And that can happen in the warmer seasons too, right? I mean, I, I've got a leaf cutter bee here. Uh, leaf cutter bees are just adorable. They stick their butt in the air when they enter into a flower. And then they kick pollen onto their abdomen. They've got a little pollen brush there, and that's how they collect their pollen. Uh, I only learn about this stuff after I take the photo, and then I figure out what the heck was I just witnessing. Uh, and so there's a sense of discovery and documentary uh, uh, to, to these kinds of images. But documentary work only gets me so excited, uh, moderately. Uh, but when I get really passionate about macro photography, that's when I start to get a little bit more inventive to be part of the artist. Um, in this case, a spider web. Obviously, I, I can't take credit for the spider web, but uh, I can take credit for the water droplets because I sprayed with a little dollar store spray bottle uh, onto this web to create this, uh, this beautiful effect of uh, the reflections of the sky and the sun uh, on this web. You can, you can be a part of it. And some people say, well, it's, uh, it's better if uh, it was natural do. Well, sure, yeah, um, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, what if you didn't have do that particular day? Or what if nature could never have created what you were trying to create. And great case in point right here, a, a freezing soap bubble. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the whole mentality of how you can create a freezing soap bubble. There's tutorials to figure this out. But my, my point is, you're never going to see this in nature. You're never gonna walk by uh, and, and tell your friends the next day, oh, you wouldn't believe the most beautiful freezing orb of ice that I found out on a nature walk with the sun setting behind it. No, it, this is purely manufactured. And that doesn't mean that it, it doesn't have value. Um, you know, in fact, the lighting in this one, there's uh, two LED flashlights, each with uh, colored gels on them, one in behind that is orange. And to make it feel like it's not a, a white balance mistake, uh, I put another one with blue on the foreground so that you had a bit of color contrast and it felt a little bit more real as a result. But some of these, these setups are deceptively simple. Uh, and I'll give you a great example that the title image uh, for this presentation 
a weevil on a flower uh, floating on water. Uh, and in behind is a Gerbera daisy, and that's what's creating the, um, the magenta purplish colors that you see in the background. Um, the setup for this is just on a table in my studio, uh, and it is this. It is the simplest possible setup you could imagine. Um, I just a bare flash, uh, no diffuser or anything on it, on, on a dumb trigger uh, that just kind of works where it doesn't, uh, just to, to fire the flash in manual mode, and uh, a square bucket of water. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a porcelain vase of some kind. Um, and I was able to shoot across the surface of the water, and the flower in the background is just there for color. And this is a free-floating uh, flower subject that ends up with this as an image. Now, the, the point here is that we don't see this from our perspective. This is a perspective that requires a very narrow point of view uh, in order to uh, elicit you know, the, the proper effect, right? It has to be the, the right angle, very low, close to the surface of the water to enhance the, the reflections. The focus is constantly shifting. And I'm shooting this um, just as the previous uh, guest had said, that uh, you know, do a lot of work handheld, and this I'm I'm moving around handheld because this flower is freely floating in order to do this, in order to to find the final image. Um, but this brings me to a point that, you know, as human beings, we see the world the way that in our daily lives it's useful for us to see. Uh, we're not going to inspect every single snowflake that we come across, uh, but the world has so much detail in so many different places and in combinations on an inconsequential level to our survival uh, are fascinating. And macro photography lets us explore that. There was a, a fun example where uh, this was last May, we had a snowstorm and uh, the great hyacinths were just, you know, they were, they were, I don't know, uh, stalwarts. They, they were uh, standing there quite strongly in that, uh, in that environment. Um, but it felt flat. Like I, I needed to do something with this scene. It's good, but it's not great. Um, and so uh, went into my studio and I grabbed the garbage can <laughs> that's in the background and um, an LED flashlight and a little tabletop tripod that's really just kind of smushed into the snow. It's nothing terribly uh, solid, but it was enough. And those flashlights, uh, I, think, I can't remember what flashlight that was. The, it's something from Nightcore. I use a lot of their uh, uh, bits and pieces. But in this case, we've got an improvement. We've got a separation of the, uh, the foreground, the middle ground, and the background. And we've got a subject that's standing out a little bit better. But if I adjust the angles slightly, moving the camera a little bit lower, then I can get that uh, pseudo horizon line in the background to play a little bit more nicely with the position of the flower. And, uh, and th this is always an iterative process. You know, we are constantly, or at least we should be taking a photo and then asking ourselves, okay, what's the next step? Even if you've got the shot that you want, ask yourself what the next step is and experiment and have some fun. And you never know where it's going to take you. This, by the way, uh, this setup is one that I had done previously, uh, a snowdrop uh, and the behind the scenes. This is how I knew that garbage can was going to work uh, as an effective trick. Uh, everything outside of the frame. And this is, you don't really see it in, in this image. Like you, you can't tell that this is, it's not fake snow. It's just snow from the corner of the yard that hadn't melted yet in the shadows that I d dug up and placed here. And it's not to say that this is deceptive. Just like the previous image, there was snow around it. It could exist this way. We are storytellers and uh, trying to tell that story as best you can with the ingredients you're given is important. Now, from an experiential standpoint, that's true, but I love to just, push all the limits of technology and equipment. And, and so you know, my neighbors often see me outside in the backyard with this monstrosity of a camera um, and all sorts of, this is like a Frankenstein beast of a, a Canon MPE 65 with some extension tubes with the old and antiquated Canon life-size converter EF um, with a young new ring flash and a bolt battery. And uh, tell you much of that was purchased through B&H. But um, the idea is that I have a lot of macro equipment, uh, more so than I think is healthy. Uh, but you will see that hey, there is a, tam a Tamron lens in, in this uh, configuration here. Yeah. But 
this collection of equipment, every single lens could be used for a different purpose. Uh, and I have a lot of fun experimenting what works for what. And in some cases, it's the extreme macro that you might be after, and, and it can kind of make things look a bit unusual, abstract, as it were, uh, pollen instead of a rose of Sharon flower, which, by the way, every flower has a different size and shape and color and texture to their pollen. And uh, you could do a whole series of work just on abstract flower parts uh, at those much more extreme magnifications. Um, this one is the, uh, I forget, I think there's a tulip and a daffodil, and I can't remember what the others were here, but uh, there could be a whole series of work done with that, or just stuff in your kitchen table, or on your kitchen table. Uh, this is salt, just grains of salt, uh, or, you know, other abstract and unusual subject matter. Um, we have here a uh, the eye of a deer fly who made the mistake of landing on the back of my neck and and picking a fight and I won the fight and then I had a subject that was easy to photograph because it wasn't moving anymore. Um, so I I would try very hard not to harm a, an insect in the making of a photograph, but uh, that uh, incident happened before I thought it was a good photographic subject. Yeah, you have to defend yourself. It's all good. You got you got to defend yourself <laughs> exactly. Um, but this is still in some ways documentary. How do we get creative? How do we start creating a subject from bare bits and pieces? And sometimes it can be so beautifully abstract and artistic um, that you might have never done before, but it's not actually that hard to create an image like this. It looks almost like an abstract oil painting. But at the same time, um, is this, I think this might've been the same microscope slide. Uh, it can look almost like from a waterfall to a bird feather. What you're looking at here uh, is citric acid crystals. And you can buy bags of powdered citric acid from Amazon or health food stores. I think they sell it as a preservative. Um, and just mix some of that in with water and uh, put it on a microscope slide or just a plate of glass from an old picture frame and let it evaporate. Uh, when it uh, when it gets to a certain um, sort of concentration, it'll start crystallizing uh, all over that plate of glass, and it'll create these beautiful, colorful patterns. They're not colorful as you would normally see them, or like uh, with your own eyes. They're actually quite monochromatic. But this is using a makeshift polarizing microscope, which you can make at home. And the next slide I'm going to show you is. It might be intimidating, but really it isn't. Um, there is a lot of gear at play here, but when you break it down to the core simple ingredients, uh, it's actually pretty simple. So basically what that, those core ingredients are uh, is a, uh, an LED flashlight uh, just shining up through a polarizing filter. Uh, and then I've got a little crab clamp that I'm using as a stage because it's what I had handy. Um, and another polarizing filter on top. If you're a, uh, uh, a photo gear hog and have gear acquisition, uh, acquisition syndrome like I do, you probably have at least one polarizing filter, possibly more. And so I put them to work in this setup. And it's, it's a simple stack, right? You get polarized light on one side, goes through the subject, which is on this little plate of glass, and it gets polarized in the opposite direction. Now, keep in mind, uh, cross-polarization is how uh, variable neutral density filters work, right? You've got two polarizers in complete opposition, they become very, very dark. Um, but if something in between the two of them mucks with the diagonal or the direction of light, and I, I'll save you the physics lesson on, on birefringence uh, for that, but if you put something in between that changes it, you'll get some colors that come out on the other side. And it's just a simple stack of, yes, I'm using a 10 times microscope objective. Uh, you can get away with less in, in many different cases. And um, in, uh, in that sense, we've got uh, a really simple subject. You're creating it. Uh, it's just uh, some liquid on glass that I just put on with a, a pipette and then it dries and then it creates these beautiful crystals. But you can do this even simpler. And I discovered this sort of in a, I guess an unintended way, not for photographing things, but just to check the things that I would create. Because I might make a dozen of these things at night, go to bed, they'll evaporate overnight, check them in the morning. Uh, and when I was checking some of these things, I realized that my phone is a, uh, it's a polarized light source. It's uh, every LCD screen, now pretty well every LCD screen is, uh, is polarized. 
And that means that all I need to do is put a polarizing filter on top of my phone as a light source in order to create a, a, an image like the one that you're seeing here. This is, it's not citric acid, this is MSM. And I forget what MSM stands for. It's again, <laughs> you can get it at health food stores. It's a supplement of some sort. Um, and it can be melted directly on the glass. I bought a little hot plate that I could put outside because you know some of these things smoke and fume and it's not healthy to breathe. Um, but when it melts, it fractures almost immediately into these uh, crystals uh, within 10, 10 seconds of being removed from the heat, which is pretty fun. Uh, or something a little bit more stable. This is um, menthol crystals. And uh, yeah, again, you can just buy bags of menthol crystals and uh, throw that together and, and see uh, it, it melts at less than the boiling point of water. So it's not exactly uh, dangerous. Uh, don't breathe a whole lot of that stuff in. You'll feel like you just, you know, took some cough medicine. But uh, when it, uh, when it resolidifies, it turns into these really cool uh, crystals, like almost like fern-like uh, or something like this. This is a uh, what could be mistaken for a topographical map of the ocean floor. Uh, this is uh, beta alanine, uh, an amino acid. It's something that you're supposed to take, I think, like before a workout to improve the performance of whatever you're doing. I'm, I'm a thin man, but I'm not a fit man. I, my accountants question these purchases, and then I show them the images that I make with all these unusual bits and pieces. Uh, back to one of my favorites, uh, the classic uh, of citric acid. And this is just all done. Uh, you can do it on your kitchen table kind of thing. It's, it's not a difficult thing to do. And every time you do it, it's going to give you different results. It's fascinating. My, my wife actually dislikes this series of work quite a bit because she's a fairly accomplished abstract oil painter. And when she sees images like this, uh, she kind of grumbles and, and, and doesn't really, uh, well, she likes it, but that's the problem because uh, it, it does the, like science is doing the job of, of the art in this particular case. And it can be cosmic too. You know, I've got a, a, a colleague that uh, sent me this, this is, well, it doesn't look great right now, but this is the uh, slice of a, uh, of a meteorite that fell in Northwest Africa. And, uh, in regular light, it doesn't look great, but, uh, let's reconstruct my makeshift, uh, polarizing microscope. And I've got just like gooseneck arms holding stuff together. Um, I have a uh, Novoflex Castel Micro, which is a uh, very good, the best I've used uh, automated focusing rail. Uh, and uh, they also made the, the tube lens that uh, connected to the microscope objective in this particular case. And I've used a number of uh, automated focusing rails. There's some from Wii Macro and Cognosys, and of course uh, the Novoflex automated rail. Uh, and I can tell you, especially at higher magnification, that's, uh, that's the one that you want to uh, take a look at. It's, it's more expensive, but you get what you pay for in, in that regard. Very happy with that. But the thing is, um, this, uh, in this configuration, becomes literally a celestial mosaic. Um, it is uh, phenomenal. I, I, I can't take, again, I didn't make this. I didn't make it like the citric acid and I had a secret recipe or something. No, this is something from outer space. Uh, and uh, you can actually buy slices of microscope slides in various marketplaces. Uh, I don't know if there's any listed on eBay, but I've seen some auctions for them. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun to see what that stuff comes up with. But that same setup, uh, using a, an automated focusing rail and a microscope objective, um, you can create images like this. This is suspicious. Uh, it looks vaguely like a coronavirus. It is not. Uh, this is a grain of pollen from a rose of Sharon flower uh, that measures less than a millimeter across. And it's fun to see what you can experiment with in that regard. Um, this sitting next to a very similar grain of pollen is a meteorite, a micrometeorite that measures probably about a third or a quarter of a millimeter across, uh, just to give you a sense of scale that, um, that we're getting uh, along here. So uh, in this sense, uh, I tried to combine a couple of things together. I call this one um, heaven and earth. Uh, you've got a micrometeorite sitting on top of a grain of sand from a beach in Oregon. And uh, it's a faceted garnet on a very, very small scale. And so a lot of times you'll see people thinking, okay, well, a microscope objective, what, what really is interesting there? How can you be artistic? And uh, well, you can be, it's much more difficult the closer you get. 
Um, but uh, uh, here's a, another, this is one of the hardest images to take in my, in my professional career from a technical standpoint, because it's a, uh, a meteorite made of forced right. So it's a translucent mineral that I have to both front light by getting a bit of texture on, uh, on the surface so that we can reveal that, but backlight, having light pass through it while having the general field uh, around it to be black, uh, all with a subject that measures a quarter of a millimeter across. Now, um, we, don't, uh, uh, we don't start there. You know, this is much further down the road. Um, and uh, I, I think somebody in the chat says, does uh, BNH carry the Novoflex Castel Micro? It does. BNH does carry that. We do. Um, and we also have a discount on pretty, pretty much all the Novoflex rails except for the Micro, just because there's realistically no uh, margin on that one. <laughs> but uh, the, the, it, <laughs> and you see why when, when you see this, it's a very complex, wonderful thing yeah. that they should, you know, it's, it's, High price, there's no question, but honestly, the value is higher than its current selling price, in my opinion. Um, it's stunning. It, it is pretty cool. Um, but let, let's get into uh, one of the topics that I really want to dive into today. And it's something, again, that we can all do right at home. Um, and this is water droplet refraction photography, where uh, we use water droplets as little lenses. Um, you know, the more spherical a droplet is, the more it will act like a lens, like a tiny crystal ball. Uh, and in behind, you can place something that will show up inside every one of those droplets. A setup for something like this is very, very simple. And let's go through the basics as to not only how to set it up, but how to shoot it. And so just to uh, have a, a bit of a laugh, I used one of my old lenses. This is um, a vintage, uh, Canon macro photo 20 millimeter lens on a bellows system from 1976. Just because you can. Uh, you don't need the latest and greatest. It does really boil down to how you use it. Um, and hey, look at that. It's still that bare flash with a piece of cardboard that is uh, uh, acting as a, as a flag. It's casting a shadow on what you can barely see here. You probably can't even see it. Um, there's a dandelion seed uh, that is stuck in, uh, in a clamp. And uh, that made this as an image. Uh, kind of fun and abstract and uh, hopefully, hopefully useful. Um, using more modern equipment. Uh, again, these droplets were just from a spray bottle. Um, this one was done, I think, with the Canon MPE 65 millimeter lens. Um, and uh, the droplets came by putting the uh, seed, uh, the single dandelion seed, in front of an ultrasonic humidifier for about 10 minutes. Or I don't even know how long. I just walked away and I came back later. Um, and it was just completely covered in, uh, in these droplets. And, and I started setting up the shot. Other times, and I'll show you behind the scenes of, of all these setups uh, in, in a minute, uh, or of choice ones. This one was a bit more deliberate with the positioning of these droplets. That's a, um, a cucumber vine tendril. Uh, just from our garden, before I was planting it outside, I took it into the studio. And sure enough, it uh, gave me some nice droplets placed specifically using a hypodermic needle. Uh, an insulin needle or, and you can buy these that have blunt tips, of course, if you uh, want to be, be safe about it. Um, and uh, the, the metal of the needle is very hydrophobic, meaning that it, it, water wants to get away from it. Water is afraid of it, I guess, technically the term would be. Um, but it, so the water will more easily jump to whatever you want to make it stick onto. Uh, and that's how I can create images uh, such as this one here with these five droplets on a flower petal all just placed with a needle uh, and all just plain tap water. Uh, I get asked a lot, you know, what, uh, what kind of liquid this is? Do you add glycerin to it is always a common question. Uh, no, I, I've tried. Uh, glycerin can change the viscosity of the water such that uh, it will um, uh, you know, stick better to places that it otherwise would roll off of. But uh, no, in, in this instance, it's, uh, uh, it's just plain old tap water. And, and same here too. The, the, the trick about these types of images is it's not, how should I say this? Um, 
it's not difficult to photograph once you've done it once. There's a certain amount of muscle memory in, in how you shoot some of these setups. This is a blade of blue fescue. Uh, bluegrass has a powder-like coating that's also hydrophobic, so it creates these nice uh, you know, spherical droplets instead of it kind of uh, spreading out like a sheen. Uh, and it is in a bowl of water on my kitchen table, just a, a glass bowl I bought from the thrift store and, uh, you know, it, the, the trick is that this is the behind the scenes setup, right? And um, it's just a, some type of osteospermum flower and you've got uh, the blade of grass that's held underneath the water with this uh, third hand tool or helping hand tool. Um, and uh, another one, you know, I'm using an overturned coffee cup to get the right elevation of things. It's, it's very DIY, but it's so DIY that I could spend three or four hours uh, just tinkering and not come up with anything useful. You know, when I was working on this image, the thought process was, okay, um, reflections and refractions at the same time, go. And using mylar and mirrors and the surface of water and just doing all sorts of experimenting with all sorts of different subjects arrived here. If I knew I was going to make this, well, it wouldn't have taken me three or four hours, but you don't know where you're going to go uh, when you start the experimental process. And we've got a few other uh, things to consider here too. We've got, in this case, um, this is lupin leaves. The lupin flowers are beautiful, but the leaves of the flower have these feathery-like bits that remind me of those uh, wildflower seeds, dandelion seeds and, and others. And, uh, and so they create these nice uh, you know, spherical droplets. But when I was editing this image, I really kind of fell out of love with it because it was shot in this orientation. And to me, as I was just, uh, and, and I will talk about some focus stacking techniques and things which I had used uh, in, in this image. Uh, oftentimes focus stacking is, is done for me handheld uh, for subjects that require um, uh, extreme timeliness. So snowflakes where they're actively sublimating or blowing away. Uh, water droplets, I'm slowly you know, uh, buttoning down a little bit more and, and using more on, on a rail. And you'll see an example of that. Uh, in a minute. But this to me looked like a, an alligator jaw with flower teeth, which doesn't really connect with me in any meaningful way. But when I rotated at 90 degrees, um, it, uh, it all of a sudden worked. It just it felt more symmetrical, even though the symmetry hasn't changed from, from one to the other. Um, and, uh, and that brings me to another, uh, another fun image. Actually, th this is really important for me. Th this image I had taken uh, a number of years ago, I think in 2012 or 2013, um, by using a, um, uh, a map, uh, a, just a map of, uh, of the earth from NASA's public domain archives. And, and actually, um, I, uh, I might be able to, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly where it is right now, but uh, if I am able to, to get a link to that, I'll make sure that I share that with everybody because uh, it's freely available and, uh, and you can download that and print it off and stick it behind things. And I wanted to redo this image because a, a week ago it was Earth Day and I had the idea, um, the idea to, uh, you know, just take another stab at this. I've got, you know, a couple more experiments and, and years under my belt and, and, and new bits and pieces of gear too. So um, I, I created this, this setup. And uh, so there's just, a, again, another printed map. I, I was using a, um, and this might be important, a matte paper stock uh, from my printer because the matte paper won't give me uh, glare and reflections, which you don't want to have. Um, and uh, a flashlight aimed mostly on the background, but a little bit on the foreground as well. And I've got two uh, flower petals that for maybe an hour to two hours worth of work, it took me to get them to bend into a heart shape. Uh, you know, lots of different uh, experimentation and what have you uh, in there. Uh, and again, you can see I'm not using a macro lens. I'm using the, uh, the Lumix 24 to 105 millimeter uh, kit lens that came with my uh, uh, S1R that you see in the frame. Um, and it's generally a pretty good close focusing uh, lens. But to get the framing that I wanted for this, I used the, uh, the NovoFlex um, uh, bellows set. And they've got an auto bellows set for the L mount and, and I believe for other uh, platforms as well. 
uh, and set that all up in front of the uh, in front of the camera and um, turned into to this image. Just finished editing this one last night because I shot it yesterday. Um, and to me, this is a it is a symbolic photograph. Uh, you know, especially right now with all of the chaos and uncertainty in the world. Uh, you know, some people might say climate change is a is a huge issue. Other people say you know the you know, world economies are at risk. And there's just so much that is making the world um, sort of dangle by a thread. And, uh, and as much as we love this world, uh, we also know how fragile it is. And, and to me, this image is uh, it kind of embodies that, uh, that whole mentality. So uh, I'm glad with the way that that, uh, that particularly uh, turned out. Um, here's another behind the scenes setup that shows some of the bits and pieces. And, you know, I, I love to use uh, advanced gear uh, whenever possible, but I also use cardboard boxes. And there's, there's a lens, there's a 12 to 32 millimeter lens that I'm using to prop up the other end of this thing because it was the closest thing to me that I could reach. And so, well, while I love all of this gear, and, and by the way, the, the um, uh, uh, Novo Flex is proudly featured in, in a lot of this stuff here, um, but they make this this gooseneck arm that is the most robust and sturdiest gooseneck that I have ever had my hands on, um, and uh, all sorts of other little clamps and accoutrements that make tabletop macro photography so much easier. And yeah, you know what? I'm also using a seven dollar uh, helping hand, a third hand tool here because it had a clamp that was a little bit stronger on a tiny little area to hold things together right. Uh, some tools work better than others in different areas, but it all kind of coalesces together. Um, that, uh, that setup there created this, uh, this image. Now with macro, uh, you often get uh, you know, a lot of uh, intense colors, right? Or you can, you can seek them out. And it's far easier to have a really intense macro image in terms of color uh, than with landscape. I mean, you got to seek out the season and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, color accuracy can sometimes be really important with a lot of this work. Um, and, uh, you know, this one, in this case, the exact color of the flower petal doesn't need to be perfect. I mean, I'd like to start with a better standpoint than, uh, than anywhere else. Um, and so I've used a number of tools in my kit. This was such a fun one because I, I did some uh, silly experiments after the fact. Um, as you know, you can get uh, uh, calibration tools for your camera. And this is an X-Rite Color Checker Nano uh, that they make it small enough that I can fit it inside of a flower. Uh, and especially, you know, when you've get these, got these vibrant uh, magentas and these nearly out of gamut colors, it's really helpful to sort of get, get a grounding onto what exactly that color is gonna be. And I was setting up an image that had, um, I, I would say, a reason for some color accuracy. And that final image ended up being this guy here. Uh, an entomologist would want that shade of green on this particular weevil to be proper uh, and that flower to be accurate as well. Uh, I found this, uh, this weevil in my sunroom. And before I put him back outside, I took him into the studio and set him up on a, uh, a grapevine tendril. And um, you know, I, I created the, the surrounding uh, droplets first. Uh, where you've got, uh, you know, the, the flower refracting in the background and the one big one in the middle. And then I figured, let's just see what happens if I add this weevil. And he meanders around all the way to the top, he or she, I'm not sure. Um, and then just kind of sits there. I'm thinking, well, what is he doing? Um, and, and I looked at an example from two different photos that I had taken. And uh, he was drinking the water droplet. I guess he was thirsty in the center. There was no water in there. Um, and so he was just hanging out there perfectly still. So I had the idea to put a water droplet on his head to give him a flower hat. And there's his flower hat. Um, because why not? I mean, I already had the safety shot without it and he's not moving. Let's just take that one step farther and see what you can do and take it a step farther just for fun. If you put that color checker uh, right in behind it, it'll actually work. I kind of like the background in a very strange type of way. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I use this for certain areas that are a little bit more, uh, you know, you need, to, like I've done product photography on a very small scale where color is super important. Um, and so that uh, color checker comes in handy in terms of, uh, you know, something on my equipment list. Very tiny, but very good. Um, 
ants are less cooperative than weevils. This guy did not sit still. He was racing across this. This is a, a seven shot focus stack um, that was uh, done completely handheld and took most of a day to get. This is when um, the carpenter ants in my backyard are all um, protecting the peonies. Uh, peonies have extra floral nectaries, which means that they produce nectar on the outside of the, um, uh, of the flower uh, so that the ants find it and drink it. But then they're constantly circling the flower, protecting it from other predators. So when I poke a stick at those ants, they ravenously race up the stick. And then I put the ant uh, on this pre-constructed setup and he just kind of races across looking for something to bite. Um, so um, I guess he got a fresh drink of water instead. Um, this example, um, this is where that color accuracy, I think, comes in really important. You've, uh, this is the wing of a Madagascan sunset uh, butterfly. I, actually, it's a moth. Um, and uh, to get these colors accurate, I think, would be really a good use of uh, you know, a, a color checker, but also uh, a good use of um, that Castell Micro, because, um, or, or I should say any focusing rail, but for something this small, uh, this required 997 separate shots to be combined. Um, I, I think I shot a thousand of them and then I just trimmed a few off the sides um, because a single individual frame uh, would give me this amount of focus. The closer you get to a subject, the shallower your depth of field will become. This is just a universal truth of the matter. Uh, and so, yeah, you get closer, your depth of field gets shallower and shallower, and you want to be in control of exactly how the camera moves forward and backward, shifting that focal plane around. At this scale, in-camera focus bracketing and things just don't cut it. Uh, you need to use external tools to do it. And, you know, sometimes that depth of field is so ridiculously shallow um, that even if I did stack this one, I don't even think it would turn into anything useful. Uh, it's just pollen on a flower petal. Um, and uh, maybe I should go back and revisit some of these ideas. But uh, it, it, there's so much. There's so much to explore. Um, now, before I get into another really useful technique here, uh, let's go to a couple of uh, questions that might be in the chat here. Uh, Peter says, Don, do you have a photo school background or self-taught? Well, Peter, my uh, formal education is advertising. Um, and I guess that kind of means, you know, uh, public speaking, which is sort of what I'm doing now, uh, but also visual communication and, uh, and storytelling and, and building narratives, putting yourself in, uh, in the scene of, of some other location um, in order to, to make sure that somebody other than yourself is responding to a message. And, um, that I, I found valuable, but it also taught me small business techniques to uh, you know, be a, an entrepreneur. And most photographers are small business owners. So um, thank you for that question, Peter. Absolutely no professional training in photography or science. Um, and uh, uh, BH, uh, nice work, uh, great presentation. Where do I get my inspiration from? Uh, BH is asking. Uh, can you give re any recommendations on creative books? Uh, well, I will give a quick plug to, to my upcoming book in, in just a little bit as well. But um, creative inspiration uh, comes from always asking questions and reveling in your mistakes um, and understanding the gear well enough that the gear no longer matters. Uh, I, I know that sounds somewhat counterintuitive, but um, you know, w when you see an image like this, this is a, a blade of eucalyptus. And uh, eucalyptus has, again, a powder-like coating that makes these nice spherical droplets on it. And so I get that and I figure, okay, well, that, that's a puzzle piece. Uh, let's try to put some of these puzzle pieces together and see which ones fit. And not all of them do. And so a lot of times I, I just spend hours and I get nothing as a result. Absolutely nothing as, as, a, final, uh, as a final thing. Uh, but other times, um, you know, you end up with an image like this, which I believe uh, B&H was, was using to, uh, to promote uh, this, uh, this talk today. And this is a prairie smoke wildflower seed. And prairie smoke, uh, clematis functions very, very similarly. Um, it has sort of a, a spine uh, with all these little frilly bits that come, come off of it. Uh, and they hold water droplets quite nicely. And getting this position just on the surface of water so I could get a pretty clean reflection on the bottom was tricky to do. There, there was hours of, of work. But importantly, um, 
I was focusing more on the art here and less on the post-processing because this is a single shot straight out of camera without focus stacking required. And uh, I hope some people listening just perk up in their chair a little bit when they hear that because yes, this can be technical, but there might be some tools that you already own um, that might be an advantage for you. So here's an example of a, of a setup. Uh, again, I'll use whatever's around me. Uh, a clothespin, if that works, sure. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I've got a, a flashlight on a, um, uh, just a, a, a gooseneck arm here, and it's pointed at the, at the flower in the background, not at the foreground. And the image straight out of camera looks like this. And in this kit, uh, you've got, you know, a, an image with a lot of wasted space and you've got, you can see the, the clamp, the, the clothespin, what have you in here. But in this example, um, I've turned on the high resolution mode of my camera. Uh, a lot of cameras have this feature now. Uh, Olympus, Panasonic, uh, Fuji, even in the GFX cameras, Sony um, and others, uh, I'm sure uh, it, it's going to be more and more common, uh, is that you can turn on this mode and have the camera on a tripod and use... Uh, basically quadruple the resolution of your image. So my 47 megapixel camera becomes a 187 megapixel camera body. Uh, and that uh, I don't need. I don't need 187 megapixels. If anything, uh, most of the images in my professional career were shot with cameras around the 20 megapixel range, and that was good enough. Um, but what that gives me is the ability to crop in extensively uh, on an image. And uh, now there's only so far that you can go, you know, there, the laws of diffraction uh, cannot be avoided. And, and so, you know, you're still beholden to physics here that uh, your resolution, if you get super close and crop in, diffraction is going to be a problem. When I'm doing this type of work and I'm taking this image uh, to, to create this as a, final, uh, as a final image, there's almost no post-processing required. I mean, I cropped it and whatever basic adjustments in, in Lightroom I, I may have applied um, to, to get us here. And that was shot at something around F9 or F10. Uh, most of these work uh, that, that, is, uh, that you're seeing using a, um, uh, a continuous light source, a, a flashlight, they will be done using aperture priority mode and an aperture usually somewhere between F8 and F11. Uh, and uh, as low an ISO as I can handle. However, because a lot of these images have fairly uh, you know, smooth and out of focus backgrounds, um, noise reduction doesn't really hurt them that much. And so don't be afraid if you have to crank up that noise reduction uh, to levels that you wouldn't be comfortable with in landscape or portraiture, they'll probably still work for you well in the macro realm. And that's always a rolling target, right? Your, your ISO setting, on one camera is gonna be different than the next one that you buy, which will be performing better uh, at those higher sensitivities. Um, Barb says, are some of the techniques in your new book waiting for it to arrive with bated breath? Well, yes, they are, uh, uh, Barb. Everything uh, that we've talked about so far is, uh, is, is in my upcoming book on macro photography, um, uh, including you know this image, which uh, I kind of learned I, well, I don't want to say that there was a mistake here. I really like the image, but it's a bit softer than I would have liked because using the high resolution mode, I had shot this at, um, at F14, uh, I think. And diffraction, when you crop in that much, you, you don't just get resolution for free. Um, you know, your pixels effectively become smaller and uh, diffraction limiting can sneak in a little bit earlier than it otherwise would. And if I were to shoot this again, I would, uh, I would definitely, uh, you know, lighten that up from F14 to F11, even though I, I don't have almost, F I have almost everything in focus, not quite, but uh, I would rather a bit more sharpness and sacrifice a bit of depth in order to get the same image that I call um, first dance. It's rather difficult to anthropomorphize dandelion seeds, but I believe I've done a the best job as I could uh, to do that. Uh, most of these droplets, by the way, are from a spray bottle really handy, but the two big ones, one on each of the, uh, the seeds, that was placed there with a needle. Uh, so I, everything was all set and then I just tried to place the bigger droplets on top. And I was told I, I would be able to, uh, uh, to 
to plug my upcoming book, which, by the way, in the coming days, uh, you know, it's going to start shipping soon uh, in the first half of, of May. Uh, it's, it's on press right now. It might even be on a truck to me uh, as I speak. Um, this book, I am working diligently to get listed on B&H as well. Uh, so you can look for it there soon. If you did want to uh, uh, get it uh, possibly a little bit, uh, you know, pre-order it. Now, I do have my own website at uh, skycrystals.ca that you can get it there, but uh, I'm actively talking with B&H to stock it. So uh, that, uh, that shouldn't be too long before that happens. So I can't wait till we get it done. Yay. I can't wait for you guys to get it. I was just talking to the, the buyer and the, the only thing that's holding me up is that the printer hasn't told me how many books are in each box so that I could get a proper order placed and so on and so on. But we're like, we're just about there. We're, uh, right. we're, we're inches away from, from getting that on, on B&H. I'm getting um, one. Um, now, I do have a little bit of time left. And so I wanted to talk about another unrelated topic, but it's something that would pique a lot of people's interest, I think. Um, and that's how you can take a flower like this, uh, which is a, it's a nice looking succulent flower. It's not amazing. But if I transform this into something such as this, would you be interested? Um, I think that a lot of photographers would love to know how that transformation happened. Uh, before we get too far into this realm, Barb asked, have I ever used water beads? And I own some, Barb, but I haven't used them yet. Uh, it's on my to-do list. There's just too many irons in the fire, but I suspect that they would work wonderfully for a lot of this type of stuff, just like a super tiny lens ball, uh, maybe uh, able to do some, uh, some extra fun tricks with it. I can imagine like dropping one down and uh, photographing it in mid drop or something like that. I got ideas, uh, always a lot of ideas. Um, but uh, it, in this image here, we've got um, ultraviolet fluorescence. We can make things glow under ultraviolet light. Uh, and so, you know, for example, take this, take this row of diamonds and diamonds are actually an inexpensive subject. Uh, you can buy little baggies of them for 40 bucks, uh, hundreds of them, uh, and they're all impure and, and rough. And, and so th this setup looks rather intimidating, right? Um, but it is, uh, this tiny little, um, uh, row of diamonds that you see there, uh, surrounded by ultraviolet flashlights. And I don't know if b &H carries the ones that, that, that I've got uh, here at play, um, but I know b &H does carry them. And it, the brand doesn't matter, uh, honestly. It's the type of um, uh, the, uh, the diodes in there. So uh, Nichia or LG diodes, uh, those are going to work really, really well, give you a nice clean output. Um, and if a flashlight is good enough to actually list the type of diode that it uses, it's probably going to be, be good enough. Um, and some safety glasses. So um, this is uh, uh, a, a, a must, I'll say, you know, it's somewhat inconvenient, but, you know, protect your, protect your eyes. They're valuable. We're photographers. We know how valuable our vision is. Um, but if I have this row of diamonds and I turn off the room lights and I turn on my ultraviolet lights, it turns into this as a subject, which I find just absolutely fantastic. Uh, I mean, yes, I arranged them in, in uh, sort of a rainbow alignment, but I, I just get so excited when I can play with things that have near magical qualities, including flowers in my backyard, right? This is uh, an ultraviolet fluorescing, I don't know, it's something like a, a Scylla flower. I'm not sure exactly what it is. It's a dainty little white flower that just finished blooming right now, and it turns into all sorts of colors under ultraviolet fluorescence. And even super ugly flowers, like this zucchini flower, uh, when it fluoresces, it, it has a life of its own. Uh, and fluorescence, by the way, doesn't require any special filters for your camera uh, or your lens, no special lenses, no modifications to the camera or anything. You're effectively collecting visible light. Uh, ultraviolet light hits the subject, excites the atoms in, in the subject so that the electrons go to a slightly higher orbit and then immediately collapse back down but lose some energy in the process and visible light of lower energy comes back at you. So you're collecting visible light, but the source is unique. And that's where things get interesting. And you can play with this in so many different ways. Here's a hellebore flower uh, from our backyard. And uh, hellebores, uh, Lenten roses or Christmas roses have very fluorescent pollen. So I went ahead and using a, uh, a small uh, smoke machine, fog machine, uh, created some atmosphere in the air and, uh, and lit this thing up like it was a tiny little lantern. And uh, 
you know, in, in this case, uh, I brought out my, uh, my good friend, the green immigrant leaf weevil again. And uh, that's a, it's a, just a fluorescing mineral, hackmanite, I think, uh, that has a grapevine wrapped around it. This one required an ultraviolet flash. And I, I know uh, that uh, you can buy these commercially. I've made my own. I don't necessarily recommend that you make your own flashes. Um, but uh, you know, if, you, if you did want to do something like that, I think that uh, you know, you're on your own. I'm not going to give you any hints here because opening up high voltage electronics is probably not a good idea. Um, but anytime that I have a fast moving critter like a bug you might want to use them in this case this attack of the flashes um i didn't need to uh to, to use that uh, at all i could have used a single led flashlight and just moved it around painted it around um and that uh, in that case this is with visible light regular lights all all on um and uh, turn off the room lights and it is transformed into something that looks like it should be in avatar um you know it's it's so otherworldly looking, even though it's exactly the same thing. This is shot with a, a Lumix GX9 uh, and uh, a Leica 45 millimeter macro lens and nothing else fancier than that. Just a nice, uh, good quality micro four thirds setup. Um, and uh, same thing here, uh, another succulent. Succulent flowers, for whatever reason, uh, they usually, not always, but they usually have a light show uh, when, when they fluoresce. And, and there's another cousin of that previous one. but they come in unexpected locations. Uh, you know, another great example would be uh, this uh, snowdrop flower, one of my wife's favorites. We've planted a whole bunch in the yard. Uh, well, what happens when they fluoresce? Well, it looks like I would get an electric shock if I were to touch this thing, uh, because it does look quite electrified as a, as a result here. And, uh, and from that perspective, you know, I think, okay, well, if plants look like this, what about other animals? Um, how about this, this ugly bug? Uh, she's not going to win any beauty contests, this dog day cicada. Um, I almost stepped on this one when I was uh, just kind of walking to my car and I was going to pick it up and just move it off uh, the driveway uh, onto the lawn, but it just kind of hung out in my hand. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, hmm, let's try something. Just take it into the studio. I uh, made this setup and uh, turned off the room lights and that cicada, uh, well, from beast to beauty, I would say, uh, is, is quite dramatic in, in what you see the final result of here. And I've done tons of experimentation with this uh, in, in the past. Uh, um, this uh, green iridescent sweat bee, uh, that gets transformed uh, into, into this. But uh, I had to do this outside. My, it's one thing for me to bring a cicada in the house. My, my wife kind of draws the line at bringing bees and insects that can sting uh, into the house. So this one had to be done uh, outside. And, uh, you know, just tripods that are doubling as light stands uh, with this uh, sort of screen that would go over top. And, uh, uh, and, and from there, uh, I, when I say screen, it's just a big piece of felt just to make shadow, to make darkness. Um, and then I plucked a couple of petals from a flower and the bee was sleeping in the flower because it was so cold that morning. And I just breathed on the bee to wake it up and started wandering around. And, and that was, that was that shot. Um, uh, uh, one, uh, word of, of warning here too, uh, you know, some, you can use artificial, uh, fluorescent items of highlighter ink is, is a great example. Uh, it fluoresces whatever the color of the highlighter is. Um, so I put a bunch of, uh, led flashlights around in this configuration, uh, and it created this image that, uh, you know, kind of looked like the flower petals were bending down towards, uh, the, uh, uh I don't know, a seat of warmth next to the fire, uh, sort of idea. Um, and I like that. And I came back to, to this later on to clean it up. But what I found was, was this, uh, because the amount of ultraviolet light that was hitting that, uh, that part of the flower was so intense that it bleached those flower petals. And so, yeah, that's again, uh, wear those glasses if you're experimenting with this type of stuff. And I wanted to see if those glasses were actually effective. And I've got some uh, expensive and obscure camera equipment that can shoot ultraviolet light directly, uh, not the fluorescent stuff, but a modified camera, a lens made of quartz elements, special filters, special lights. Um, and, uh, and I shot this self-portrait of myself. Um, it's probably the geekiest selfie that I've ever taken uh, to this point. And those glasses that I'm wearing are uh, ultraviolet uh, protective glasses. They're transparent. 
Uh, but this is illustrating to me that, yes, they are going to protect my eyes from the ultraviolet light. And um, I, I don't know what I look like here. Some mix of camera nerd meets Terminator, maybe a bit of younger David Hasselhoff mixed in. I, whatever. Uh, I did it. And there it is. Uh, embarrassment over. But uh, in this case, we've got uh, another succulent. Yeah, this is a Ornithogallum dubium, also called the Star of Bethlehem flower, that uh, creates these beautiful pastel colors. Or maybe, maybe in the case of this one here, um, I had no idea that maple trees actually had flowers until a few years ago. Um, and uh, this is maple flowers from a maple tree in our front yard. Uh, they look like alien donuts. It's just cool. Uh, lots to explore. Um, again, Attack of the Flashes here, but you replace them with just a, a single um, a single LED flashlight on a longer exposure, and, and you should be fine. But uh, from that perspective, um, notice the camera. It, it's on a focusing rail, but it's actually on the rail horizontally. And uh, that's to move the camera left and right. So I'm repurposing macro equipment for a very specific reason here. Um, and Barb says, are all the flashes synced to the camera? Yeah, they all have these little, these are um, Velo FreeWave LR triggers um, that are, uh, you can't see the trigger on the, on the camera right now. I took it off just because it was obscuring the view of, of what you're seeing. Um, but, uh, but yes, it, it would be triggered all by, uh, all by the camera. Uh, and that would create um, what, what I consider to be like this beautiful carousel of color. You know, this is a single image, it's not focus stacked, but if I were to move the camera left and right, I can create a stereoscopic 3D image pair. And, and I, I'm, a, I'm a camera nerd of camera nerds, I guess, but I love stereoscopic 3D imagery and I wanna do an experiment here to see if anybody can get this to work with the minutes that we have left. Um, this is uh, a pair where the right image is on the left side and the left image is on the right side. So if you were to cross your eyes, and they won't get stuck that way, I promise. Um, but uh, if you were to cross your eyes so that you see three images, you might have to get a little bit further away from a big screen if you're right close to it. Uh, but if you cross your eyes and you see three images and focus on the one in the middle, lock in the focus on that one, um, it will jump out at you in stereoscopic 3D. Uh, and it'll give you a total ton of depth in, in this image. And I can see it at least works for, uh, for, for one person. So that's awesome. Um, you know, we're, we're 3D creatures, right? Like we've got two eyes, we've got stereo visions. So why not take advantage of that photographically? And all you have to do is just move the camera left and right. You can do it on a focusing rail, uh, automated or not, it doesn't really matter. And you can take a bunch of images at different points along the way uh, and see which ones combine to get the greatest depth for your subject. And for those that did get that to work, here's one more as, as a bonus round. Um, which is a freezing soap bubble sitting in a flower that will jump out at you in in 3D. Now, I, I'm like for this one, I'm I have to use a, a special lens that. Um, I've got a number of lenses that have two lenses in the same barrel. Uh, they don't usually manufacture these types of optics anymore. Uh, but uh, if you can find them on uh, on used camera uh, sites, or I've I've bought the only four that have shown up on eBay in the last couple of years. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, uh, better than ViewMaster, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Kelvin says, what, what's taped on the front of the flashes? So uh, looking at this image, so. Again, I didn't want to go too much into the flash modification, but those are filters that block visible light um, so that only ultraviolet light comes through. And the flashes have been uh, modified in, in other ways as well. A shot in a controlled room. How did the flower survive? In terms of, I'm guessing, uh, the one of, uh, of the outside um, stereoscopic 3D image. Now, this is outside in the freezing cold. That flower did not survive. That flower is, is basically a colorful chunk of ice right now. If I were to take that flower inside, uh, it would turn into a puddle of mush. <laughs> it's, uh, the cell structures are completely destroyed, although it doesn't look like it um, in, in this image. So. Um, so we have a lot of fun and experimenting and uh, just always know there's, there's, another, there's another way you can push further uh, and, and, and view things in a, in a different way. Um, so two final stories before we uh, wrap up here. And I might go a few minutes over. Uh, you can leave if you want. I, I wouldn't feel bad, but um, this is uh, getting right near the end here. Um, 
I have a, a rock, uh, a mineral, a, a piece of cerocyte. It's a, it's a lead ore variety that happens to fluoresce from this particular location in about the same brightness as, um, uh, or the same color as the sun. And I've placed it nestled into some Spanish moss with a bunch of Irish moss flowers kind of pointing in towards it. And uh, in that sense, if I turn off the room lights and turn on the ultraviolet lights, then it will glow. And it will glow as a representative of, uh, or an approximation of heliotropism where the you know, plants and flowers will like move uh, with the sun through the sky. Uh, and so that becomes the resulting image. This is purely manufactured. This, this doesn't exist as anything you could find in nature. It's that mix of that art and science together into one. Uh, and yeah, you know what, uh, Mark, all plants were harmed, I suppose. Um, but uh, as soon as you buy a bouquet of flowers, those are cut flowers. They, you know, you, they've been harmed right away. Uh, and this is all stuff that I'm in possession of. I'm not going out to a botanical garden and maiming their flowers. Um, but in, in this case, this turned into a, you know, a useful uh, narrative, I thought. Um, and uh, here's another great example. Sometimes I'll take the, uh, an ultraviolet flashlight and, uh, and just kind of look outside at night around the garden every couple of weeks, see what's blooming, see what's glowing. And this uh, gooseneck loose strife, which is kind of invasive, but we still have some in the, in the yard. Uh, if I were to see this in ultraviolet light, it is like a fireworks show going off. And so how do I possibly get this to work? And I went to bed that night thinking about this and how I could put an, an image together. And I remembered um, that I had this tunnel geode um, that, uh, you know, open on both ends. So I could light from one side and I could get a camera in on the other side. And I finally found a use uh, for the lens in the foreground here, that Lyoa 24 millimeter probe lens, which is so cool in theory, but Practically, it's very difficult to use for any particular shoot. It does have a ring of LED lights uh, along the, the, the top of it there. Uh, uh, just, you know, you can plug it in and illuminate your subject from a very close distance, which is useful. But white LEDs actually are ultraviolet LEDs that use phosphors to fluoresce into the visible spectrum. And so even with that light not being on, when I shined my uh, ultraviolet flashlight on it, they lit up very orange, which I thought was kind of interesting. Could I use that? Well, let's see. If I create this setup with the lens on one side and ultraviolet light on the other, and inside that geode, I have placed three of the flowers, three of those flowers from the, the gooseneck loosestrife that um, were uh, quite uh, vibrantly fluorescing to make it look like they're growing out of this tunnel, this crystal tunnel. They have just sort of emerged as, uh, as entities ready to bloom after laying dormant for 10,000 years or however you want to imagine that um, yourself. And, uh, and so that, that was, a, it was a fun process, a creative process that you really don't know where these various puzzle pieces are going to come together. Um, but so long as you have the, uh, the knowledge to, to, to know you're not going to get it right the first time, to know that you're going to have to reiterate and experiment and just have fun with the process, you'll eventually get to stuff like this uh, when all those puzzle pieces will eventually fit together in the right way. And that is the universe at our feet. Thank Out you very much. Standing. Love it. I wish we could hear the applause from the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Don, thank you so much for your time, for your brain and your creativity, man. That was a lot of fun and really just, just goes to show that there's an endless supply of uh, creative options out there for even such a narrow subject, quote unquote, as macro in the, in the wide gamut of, of photography as a whole. It's just, it's, it's endless. And, and I, I don't think I'll ever stop shooting macro. I mean, it's, yeah. it's one of those areas where, you know, you can visit every waterfall in the world and put them on a checklist and check them off and say, you've done it. I don't think you can say you've done it when it comes to macro photography in any area. Uh, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll have a lot of fun continuing that exploration. And I, I do want to just say to anybody that uh, is listening to this, if you do have questions about, I don't know, maybe it's a gear recommendation or just a technique, you can always, you know, type my name into Google. I'm very easy to find and reach out with those questions to me. I'd be happy to help you along this journey. Excellent. 
Oh man, I'm really looking forward to your book. Yeah, I hope we yes. get it in soon. I mean, I, I have technically, I, I have a, a content proof of it here. Um, right. So this is, this is, I guess, copy number one. It's not from the press, but it's just illustrating everything that we were just talking about. Uh, and, uh, and, and then some, um, and it'll be here soon, very soon. Excellent, excellent. Well, congratulations on that. Looking forward to seeing your work in the future. And I really hope we get to work together again sometime. I would love to. Thanks for yeah. having me here. Thanks, Don. Thanks. All right, everyone. Wow. Um, can't believe that's the end of Macro Week. Uh, thankfully, we do have these sessions recorded on our YouTube channel. I'm going to go uh, just remind people that we do have a couple of things um, still in play for Macro Week. And this is what we've seen. This is who we've have guests today. And there is a macro sweepstakes still happening. Um, you only have a couple more days left to submit, but definitely check out hashtag BH macro week. And we have some nice prizes from some of our vendors. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, definitely you have that, that shot of that flower, the bug or something that you've been holding back for. Well, now's your time to get it out in front of the judges and maybe win some prizes. And if you are looking for some basic inspiration or you have some questions, maybe you're just starting on your path to uh, macro wonderment, um, by all means, go to our website, type in the word macro in the search engine. And our landing page there uh, will give you everything from product tips to beginner tips, um, um, different lenses, and, and really might, might stir your imagination. It's worth uh, checking out. And I want to give a special thanks to our sponsors, Noble Flex, Nisi, and of course, my parent company, B&H Photo. Uh, without uh, their help, this would not have happened. And that's it. Um, you guys have a great one. Thank you again. Do uh, check us out on the YouTube channel if you missed the last three days. Um, we'll, we'll be viewing or we'll be playing those for a while now. And that's it from B&H. Thank you so much. See you next time.